Well, hello, everyone. Um, I'm sitting here during the All About That Place event, um, and the organisers have offered me a fantastic opportunity to interview my fast-becoming buddy, Graham Bandy, who, who, as we all know, is a massive expert on all things military. Um, and in particular, where I came across him was during Armed Forces Advice Hour, run by the Society of Genealogists, where he's been particularly helpful to me on one project that we'll come back to in a minute. But generally, his expertise is well known and renowned, I'd say, especially fascinating in terms of uniforms and how they evolved, etc. But his knowledge is just utterly profound. You may have seen his recent webinar uh, on Family Tree UK Magazine's um, website, if you're a Family Tree Plus member, I've watched it, it's brilliant, go and find it. But we're going to dig into a bit more about him here in this in this coming up interview. So hello, Graham. Great Good to see morning. you again. Good morning. We've been, we've, we've been bantering away for about half an hour already, haven't we, before we even started? <laughs> <laughs> so I want, I want to ask you about several things, especially your right. expertise and some of the really fascinating um, items that came out in that webinar. But yeah. first, in that webinar, you dropped a few things that I have to follow up on. So one is, quote, I bunked out of school at the age of 17 to join the army. So I have to ask you about that first. And we have to talk about Northamptonshire, don't we? Yes. Well, okay. Um, well, yes. Um, I'd always, I come from a family of soldiers. Um, I grew up, my great uncles, when I was tiny, who regaled me with stories of the Great War. Um, one was an old contemptible. Um, others were with the Army Veterinary Corps, the Durham Light Infantry, and loads of others. My father was in Northamptonshire. Um it's my grandfather was in the Sixth Dragoon Guards. His brother, my great uncle, was in the Somerset Light Infantry. And it's just sort of been picked up originally by osmosis. And I thought, yeah, I'm going to be a go and be a soldier. Yeah, that's what I'll do. So at 17, off I tootled to the depot of the Queen's Division. This was a year early, by You were like skipping out, like Mark Zuckerberg leaving. Yeah, well, I, 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 should have, I should have done six. <laughs> I should have done sixth form. Um, but um, I was going to do art, history of art and Latin uh, and history as A-levels, but I didn't. Well, everything's for a reason, as they say. Um, so off I pootled to, you know, start off as a, a young soldier recruit into the Royal Anglian Regiment, and uh, they found out that I was a classically trained musician. So they said, oh, here we go, you're in the band, mate. So off I went to the regimental band and spent seven years playing and tootling around the world, anything from the Royal Albert Hall to the Curium um, Coliseum thing, theatre in Cyprus. And then we went off to the Tacoma Dome in Seattle um, and got played for playing music. Oh, or what were you playing? Uh, clarinet mainly, but I really? dabble in lots of other instruments from piano to um guitars and all sorts of odds and that, that explains one question i have for you actually because in your in the last uh in, in the webinar you did for family tree i was like how did he know that the difference between that trumpet and bugle that roughly are the same is that one is b flat and one is e flat i was like how can he know this <laughs> <laughs> oh, i've that got might, i've got an original might... first world war bugle downstairs um and i've also got the cavalry trumpet as well i'd also been in the scout band as a kid and we'd been around europe twice um, playing all over the place, France, Belgium, Luxembourg, Switzerland, and then um, Belgium, Holland. Uh, where else did we go after that? Germany, we went to Cologne, played outside the cathedral there. Um, I wish I'd have known about the British Army of Occupation in 1919 in Cologne, because I'd have spent more time pooling around looking for stuff like that, rather than going into the um, museum, which was hard by the cathedral which is absolutely stonking um, with lots of Roman stuff going on there. But, you know, it's just something I've always done. Is have you still it? got your wobble? I have. I've still got my camp blanket. <laughs> I bet I knew you would have. <laughs> it still you? gets added to. Oh, I, was a quick, I, I got as far as being a Queen Scout um, and then uh, went into leadership and I scout did scouting anywhere from Northern Ireland. Um, and there's a few stories about scouting in Northern Ireland as a soldier um, that are a bit, um, well, hey, mm -hmm. but, uh, I'll I'll make your hair curl. 
um, to being um, in the 73rd Nicosia. When, when were you in Northern Ireland? Um, in the 80s. Wow. I read Actually, I read General Mike Jackson's autobiography, mm. and that whole bit about Ireland and the, that you faced was pretty, I found it quite horrific, actually. Yeah, yeah. well, I, I lost a few mates either who were out on patrol, um, one of them, uh, Geordie Mitchell, um, and Spud was with him as well. And then I lost about eight people I knew in the Regent's Park bandstand oh. bombing as well. We'd just, done, we'd just done our medical training with them because bandsmen, yeah. um, trainers, um, medical orderlies, um, mm. combat med techs, as they became, um, combat medical technicians, and we'd just done our training with them. They got their programme in first to go to Regent's Park, and our bandmaster didn't get it in, and they were the ones that were blown up. Mm. And there were only two bands in Northern Ireland at the time, so everyone was worried it was a that I knew because it was a band who were stationed in Northern Ireland who'd been blown up who were on tour in Britain and that's exactly what we were doing at the same time but um yeah it's um it's been an up and down time yeah no I've been I've been past the pluck there many times when my kids were little we mm. used to drive up to Regent's Park and walk around there and have picnics right by that bandstand and it was very haunting yeah <sighs> Hmm. So that, yeah. so doing the combat med tech stuff and then being quite unwell with a weird thing called Stephen Johnson syndrome, which you can all Google later. I um, decided laying in bed. I think I'll do nursing. I can do that. That's nice and easy. So I went off and did my nurse training. Then I was commissioned in 1999 as a nursing officer in Queen Alexandra's Royal Army Nursing Corps. Oh, we should mention your new book, right? Ah, yes. Well, my new book is... Have you got a copy nursing, to hand? No, I, it's not published yet. It's only on pre-order from Pen and Sword. It's Nursing on the Front Line. It's the story of a RAF nursing orderly who um, went all through North Africa, up through Italy, and then, weirdly, he was seconded to the Special Operations Executive Medical Mission in Yugoslavia, of which there is very, very little about. But we, I've got... I was doing one of my displays a few years ago, about 10 years ago. And this lady came and said, oh, you know, you, are you medical? I said, yes. And he said, well, you're a, a nursing officer in the army. Oh, right. Well. So when Wayne thought, came back a bit later, I think you're the person I'm looking for. My neighbour gave me a load of stuff and he always wanted it turned into a book. Um, so after several moves and all sorts of things going on, um, I found them in a box, these plastic bags, dripping with photographs, um, paintings that he'd done and all sorts of marvellous things oh, um, and all his notes. And I turned it into a book for him. But he had been he died in um, 91, unfortunately. And oh, I've got Harold details Hunt. and a link to it. In, in yeah, it's, it's on my it. website and the paintings yeah. colour on my website as well. You can find them on there. That's fantastic. Yeah. I look forward to reading that. Absolutely, definitely. So can I ask about the? You, you mentioned in the talk that you were in like the successor to the Northamptons. Do they? Yes. Presumably, they don't exist then. They, no, they they didn't ex haven't existed per se as a regular infantry battalion since 1960. They were amalgamated with the Royal Lincolnshire Regiment, became the second battalion, Duchess of Gloucester's own Royal Lincolnshire and Northamptonshire Regiment, um, the East Anglian. Ah, so which is the what you joined. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I actually joined the 2nd Battalion, the Royal Anglian Regiment, because by the time I got there, they'd amalgamated with the Leicesters and became the 2nd Battalion, Lincolns, Leicesters and Northamptons. Yeah, got to keep um, <laughs> yeah, and then in the 90s, they amalgamated again with the 3rd Battalion and are now covering Beds, Hearts and Essex as well. As So they, do they still have any link to Althorpe and the Spencers? Because there's that fantastic picture you have in your presentation where you've got the great-great-grandfather, the current, or Diana, I guess. Yeah, with his wonderful beard, and you can see there's this huge link, and they're right all Yeah, yeah, because he was ginger. That's why he's known as the Red Earl. I mean, people talk about Harry being ginger, but the fam the, the Spencer family. Uh, yeah, yeah. It was, he was known as the. It wasn't James here at all. No. <laughs> <laughs> Allegedly, <laughs> um, he um, he was this great big ginger beard, mm -hmm. and was known as the Red Earl because of it, and that's where the ginger bits come from. And is there any link still to the, the, to the success? Um, or presumably it's got watered down. Uh, 
the current Earl Spencer, Charles Author, uh, Charles Spencer, um, he's he does lots of books on um, the raw, the royalist sides of the three war, of the three kingdoms, or the English Civil War, as it's commonly known. I, I read his Killers of the King. That was brilliant, actually. I yeah, have you read the Rupert book as well? No, no, that's the only one I've read. And I noticed that um, Robert Harris's Act of Oblivion is large, is pretty much ninety percent based on. Charles Spencer's book. He, I mean, he does credit it, so it's not yeah. as in you know, his yeah. factual context comes from it. B- b- brilliant yeah. book, the Spencer yeah. one. Yeah, it is. Um, <clears throat> there we go. Prince Rupert, the last cavalier. I recommend that. Another one for my list. <laughs> <laughs> you, you give me before we went on air, as it were. You give me a whole lot of TV programs to watch. I'll, I'll add the book to it. <laughs> so but so he doesn't so they don't no, no there's no I, regiment meeting up in all thought no, for the, not what, like what, in those what, days what happened was during the um 1860s there was a, another french threat so the rifle volunteer corps were formed um a bit like um a quasi well they were the forerunners of the territorials um and they trained and they had little companies scattered around each county and one of the companies was the headquarter company of the first rifle volunteers for Northamptonshire and the colonel of that was Earl Spencer so oh, okay. so uh, well so I want to ask you about your expertise because I mean you're just such a font of knowledge I, um, I've got some specific things that you mentioned in that talk which I just marveled at but I, I want to just ask like fundamentally how this body of knowledge has, has grown. I mean, like, was there like, a, is there a set, if you wanted to start aspiring to have your level of knowledge, is there like, well, you need to go through this tome, this tome, this tome, this tome, or you, if you just put yourself out there for obviously the, you know, you being about 35 years old for the last 15 years, you know, <laughs> where, how, how have you amassed 17. such detail? I started very young. Um, I learned to read and write before I went to school. And we had tomes in the house. My parents were very big on books, which, you know, has continued. Um, Every floor, every room in the house has got at least one bookshelf on it. And even on the landing outside of here, there are seven bookcases filled with books. This is, you know, as you can see, floor to ceiling all the way around. But I started off watching programs when i was little then i was bought the british empire as a magazine um it was bbc time life program and they did a weekly magazine on it um which came out and it covered a lot of military things there we go they're even within reach as well that started it um and then when i was when i was little my dad said to me well do you want fireworks or do you want the money for the fireworks and spend it on something else? So I said, oh, yeah, books. And the first one I bought was the pan book of World War II in colour. And then, of course, I was getting all the stuff off parents, great uncles and stuff. It was all this ob- osmosis, sort of picking it up. And then I just was like a sponge for books and went round. Well, and- so if I put it in context, like things that I marvelled at were that you pointed out that you could tell if someone was cavalry or not. Um, I think this is, we were talking about artillery, but based on whether their putties were wrapped from the top down yeah. or the bottom up. I was like, yeah. well, how do you know that? So they didn't well, like, just, rub against the thigh of the horse. <laughs> that's just, yeah, that's just something that you just pick up as you go along. I mean, it, it actually signifies someone who is mounted because before full mechanisation of the British Army in 1937, well, that's when it sort of, the cavalry turned into recce tanks and tanks and stuff. Um the entire British army used horses. So everybody had horses, whether there be, you know, an infantry regiment with the transport platoon or somebody pulling the officer's mess cart around or whatever, or gun drivers, um, army service corps, they all used horses. Um, that's, that's so, a wonderful observation. Though you could see it. Yeah, and it's, a, it's a way of identifying, you know, is is this the right person as to whom I think it is when you're looking at a photograph? Well, there were so many variations. But the thing that struck me was you'd say, oh, well, this is 1915 this, this is 1914 that. And it's like almost as if the the establishment was 
conspiring to confuse mere mortals and leave it to so someone could develop an expertise. But I mean, I, I noted down, you went on how many pouches in the bandolier, um, how to, like, oh, that person's Canadian, not British because of the number of buttons you've got. Oh, it's a home service helmet. They look like police, but they're not. I mean, that one, I was like, oh, yes, I would assume they're policemen. They just look like a policeman's helmet. And then like the morning button versus in black versus the person who has all their black buttons, you know, which is a uniform. Um, right. And then I thought the pierce de resistance was you also seem to be able to date wedding dresses. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I did work with Who Do You Think You Are when they did Who Do You Think You Are Live, and I was one of the photography experts when they used to do Who Do You Think You Are Live, and one picks up a lot of stuff. Also, doing a bit of living history, as one is as one does, you tend to pick up on the girly stuff as well. And when you've got a wife who is heavily into it and who's a history MA from uh, St John's in Oxford who likes to get things right, you tend to... Um, get everything tickety boo um point in fact she got married we got married and she wore a night an original 1937 wedding dress and headdress as well mm -hmm. and you Love you that. just it's osmosis you talk to people you see things you handle the original garments and you just pick things up as you go along and it's just, just a case of retaining it it it's it, it's it's fantastic it is a black art but to get to the black art I think you should make a bibliography, like a list, the ultimate reading list. Um, I've got I've got some particular points of interest I'd actually like to ask you about mm. from that talk. So one is, I was interested that you said that civil police can arrest soldiers not dressed correctly. Either they're not, they're not walking around with their regimental oh. cane. That, I mean, that's not still today, is it? Yeah, not oh, yet. No, no, no. I haven't used regimental <laughs> cane. Saying, my friend used... in the, <laughs> could be arrested. Used... <laughs> they haven't used regimental canes or... Um anything else since the 1960s or walking out canes the, so term, was the last time you could be arrested for not like dressing correctly in the well, probably around street. about the first world war oh, okay. I mean, right. lots of yeah. things went on in the first world war because the defense of the realm act made things a little <coughs> difficult for people and even publicans because of a convalescing soldier who was dressed in hospital blues if he went into a pub and was served alcohol the barmaid and the landlady can get arrested and fined and in 1916, I've got a copy of the Daily Mirror or the Daily Sketch from 1916, and it's got two convalescing soldiers going to a pub in Liverpool. The barmaid serves them alcoholic beverages um, in full view of the landlady, and they both get fined £50 each. Well, I mean, that's a fortune. Yeah, about five grand today. There's nothing like a democracy, is there? No, but it's Defence of the Realm Act. I mean, you know, everything mm. was you know stamped upon um there was a lot of fear and mm. worry about what was going on but even into the 19th century if a command if you were taken before a commanding officer and you were accused of um whatever misdemeanor or crime that you did and you, he felt it warranted uh, an award it was always an award it was never a sentence it was an award um you always, always got off the command officer if, if you felt you'd deserve jail time you were sent to a civilian jail for hard labor mm -hmm. as the wife's three times great grandfather did um but he went on to be one of the survivors of the siege of luck now and was a well-regarded soldier at the end and had good mm -hmm. conduct chevrons and everything but uh yeah in his early days just after he joined up he got a bit drunk and um it was carted off to a jail up north somewhere where the battalion was, and uh, he was banged up in a civilian jail. He was a bit rude to me. I've got, I've got another question. Well, I've got three three specific questions yeah. that came out of that. Could you explain again the Tommy Atkins thing? So the origins ah, of the Tommy. Like, it's a shame I haven't got the thing in front of me because I could actually thought um, in the 19th century um, when people began being able to read and write after the Education Act. Um, you found that they had pay books to carry around with them, all the soldiers' pocketbook, whatever they were called, and it also listed all their issue kit. And it was a clothing book as well, and allowances and everything else. But to show them how to do it and how to fill in the clothing allowance book, there was a specimen page. And on that specimen page, um, it showed where everything went, and it was given... the. The soldier was given a name. He was known as Private Thomas Atkins. 
there are spurious stories of soldiers being captured and they're all their pay books being pulled out and they're all called Tommy Atkins because they went straight to the specimen page rather than looking at his proper That was name. the bit that got, yeah, so the Germans, I thought they were all called Oh, no, it was Tommy. before the Germans, I mean, the Boers and stuff. Oh, the Bo okay, yeah. Yeah, they all thought they were all called Tommy Atkins. I mean, people think Brilliant. it's a Kip okay. Kipling thing, although he brought it on and it's Tommy this and Tommy that and Tommy go away, but it's thank you, Mr. Atkins, when the band begins to play. Um Brilliant. I love that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's, okay. a, it's a very good long poem about soldiering. And, you know, it's, you know, still relevant today because it goes about being in Afghan and all sorts. But that's how they thought everyone was called Thomas Atkins. So they were all known mm -hmm. as Tommies. Got it. So the next thing that caught my attention that I just, I just loved, you put up a sheet, um, the, the, how the, the position that the soldier put on the stamp sent a message so it wasn't yeah. being rude if he put the king's head upside down no, or on one side or whatever it was yeah it was almost like a what would you call it it's like almost like putting an emoji on a yeah it is it's it, i mean there, there was a language of flowers in the 19th century and before so if you give certain flowers you're saying a certain thing to somebody um you know like red and white flowers you don't put red and white flowers together on a ward or anywhere else we well, never used to when you can have flowers on wards because it's blood and bandages and it's bad luck and you always have to put a different coloured flower in them, in the arrangement. So you never have that. And if you give somebody red and white flowers, it's not very nice. And lilies, they were funeral flowers, so it signifies death. So if you give your wife lilies and she looks at you a bit askance and starts slapping her around the head with, with the flowers around your head, you'll know why. It's because you're signifying death to her. What, so what did the up down, upside down stamp say, mean? Um, you, had, you had a chart of it. it was think brilliant. of me. Think it. Think of me. I can't. I haven't got it in front of me actually. Otherwise, I'd uh, bang it up. Well, but, if you could send it to me afterwards, it's, I'll the, lang it's the language I'll of flowers. In. Yeah, it's the language of flowers. Oh, okay, and brilliant. the language of stamps. It's, it was just a thing that they thing that they did. And then one more. You you referred to that there was a a plan to evacuate the royal family if Napoleon invaded. What hmm. what was the detail on that? Well, is is always um, if there was always the threat of the French. Um, we have fought them in every century so far, until this century. Um, you may think so. Oh, Second World War, they're on our side. Well, the Vichy French weren't, which are the official French government, and they fought against us in uh, Morocco and Al Algeria and in also in Mauritius. So anyway, back to, back to that days, back to the early nineteenth century. There's always a fear of what to happen. And they would, they felt that the French, if they invaded, would come straight to, you know, the royal family's residence, winds or whatever, and try and capture them. So the idea was to take them somewhere safe. And the idea was that they had a depot at Weedon in Northamptonshire, which was well served by canals. And that was where they were going to be taken because it was in the centre of the country and more easy to yeah, defend than somewhere. Yeah near the coast or London or whatever, which they would felt they would go for. <coughs> so, Brilliant. so so Ben Sharp <laughs> was on the back foot and being pushed back out in the Napoleonic Wars. <laughs> if he had be, been, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Be, he'd have backpedaled it up to Weedon to protect the royal family. <laughs> yes. Yeah, that that was that was the fallback position. Brilliant. Final round. Okay, was it I'd like to, if it's all right with you, I'd like to show the stuff that you've been helping me with as a sort of, mm, of course. Yeah, final part to it. Um, I'm going to switch over to my um, my family archive that I'm building. And uh, mm -hmm. I think I, I told you before we started, I had a, a thing that I'd like to get your input on. So I'm in my family tree because I want to start with, that's me there in the blurred. And this is my grandfather. So the guy that you've kindly been looking into for me is his yeah. cousin. Right. So if I click on my grandfather... Over here is the family in question, his uncle and aunt, his, their eldest son who got killed at Battle of Messine, and then Norman, who you've been helping me with. Mm -hmm. So if I go to Norman, he has, no, that's him as a child on his mother's lap. Nice. He has this document, um, which my dad's cousin has actually. And I know that you'll be all over this. So on the document, you've got that. Yeah, that's the crest and, the Royal Bucks is ours. And then you've got him, and I'm just really interested in what you make of all that. I don't know which, where should I start at the here. 
So that was... right, that's the crest of the rule books as are. As you saw, it's also a representation of the badge. Regimental crests are not always the same as the regimental badge, but there we are. The Yeoman of Sus the Yeoman of Buckinghamshire. Um, it's a very good book. Look for it. Um, that will tell you a bit Brilliant. more about them, the background to them. They were first raised in the 18th century um, as a thing, but they were to fight at home. And, of course, some of them became a bit naughty, which is why you got the Peterloo Massacre. Um, they were done by yeomanry. As what does well. his R mean? Um, it means that they are light cavalry as opposed to heavy cavalry, and they carry swords and they wear busbies and things. The okay. short busby with the flap on it. Um, okay, so, so of course he ends up in this machine, the twenty first machine gun squadron. Yeah, well, and he's, yeah. is that still part of the? Uh, no, what's what's happened to him? What happened is that all the regiments before nineteen fifteen had a machine gun section with Vickers machine guns or um, Maxim machine guns, and then they were then in nine, October nineteen fifteen they made up the machine gun corps so all the machine guns instead of becoming a regimental asset so it's just the colonel and 1000 men with a few machine guns they were all withdrawn the infantry regiments and the cavalry units were then issued with what's called the lewis gun which is a light machine gun and the the big heavy vickers guns which you know had a range of about four and a half thousand yards and at sort of three thousand yards if you had a um a brick wall they would take it down Amazing. so they were all made into what was known as divisional assets a division is a larger echelon which is higher than battalion because you get battalion battalions and regiments and then brigades um and then divisions um which is a, a large body of men um with various arms with them like the artillery engineers the royal army medical corps and other things which they all put together and then a division fights as they would on a grander scale than you would a battalion. So they went, were sent then to Grantham, where they formed the um, Machine Gun Corps at Belton House. There's a very good time team episode where they do some excavations at Belton House in Lincolnshire. And then they came under the control of the divisional commanders. So they could say, right, we need some machine gun support here. Uh, we need enfilading fire because they could fire over the top of a hill and do all sorts of marvellous things. And then they um, would be able to be utilised and moved a lot more and easier. Um, and if you go through the war diaries, you can see all the operational orders which are sent down from division to tell them where they were going to go. And there, as you can see, he's in the Royal Bucks Hazars there, and he's wearing one of the bandoliers. Give me a second. Now, this is the 1903 pattern bandolier, which, oh, you can't see me now, can you? Yeah, yeah, um, you're in the, yeah, you're kind yeah, of. Yeah, right, okay. This is, this is what he's wearing. This is a cavalry one. And as I was okay. saying about the, Four and five, that's what he's wearing, the longer one. The shorter one was actually initially for the infantry because you've got to be very careful with these. These are not just a cavalry item or a mounted item. In 1903, um, they found that the previous um, stuff, the equipment they used before that was a bit rubbish during the Boer War because all the rounds used to fall out of the pockets they used to wear and <clears throat> the Slade Wallace equipment that was, the white stuff you see in Boer War photographs, Second Boer War, and they felt they had to do something about it. So they devised this 1903 pattern um, equipment. It's all leather. Um, they had pouches on the belt, that, so they were carrying lots of ammunition. Um, with other bits and bobs, uh, haversacks and stuff. But by 1908, they found that it's leather, and leather's a bit rubbish when it gets wet because it gets all hard and cracky. So what they came out with was the 1908 pattern Mills engineering equipment, canvas webbing, and it's the first time that you could actually get the webbing. You could put on and take off like a jacket. You could fit it exactly. Um, and instead of putting it on 
individual pieces at a time, like you did with the previous iterations. You know, you could slap it on, slap it off, drop it, undo it a bit if you were marching, and it made it really comfortable. The wide belt gave excellent support um, around the waist, and for the carrying equipment and the marching equipment with the rucksack, um, Bergen as we call them these days, thing on the back and water bottles and everything else was nice and easy to carry. So it was great. Um, they replaced it in 1937 onwards because of the adaptation of the Bren gun as the light infantry section weapon. But there he is wearing a cavalry version, so it'd be the big long version with a double set of pouches, the mounted version, because they were often running ahead of the people. And they also had these two of these tied together around the horses' heads as well, and the necks. So you yeah, had plenty of ammunition if you got cut off. Well, I'm interested you mentioned he's running ahead, because, of course, the, the great thing tip you gave me um, in the armed forces uh, advice hour was to seek out this book, which I have. Yes. A brief record of the advance of the Egyptian Expeditionary Force written by General Sir Allen Allenby with extracts from T.E. Lawrence, of course, Lawrence of Arabia. Yeah. There's, there's, um, it's the first time that T.E. Lawrence was in print, and there's actually two sections by him. And this page, this page that you pointed me at, that what it tells me is that he was crossing the River Jordan. Don't know which side he was when he died, but on the day he died, they were crossing the River Jordan at El Mujami or something. And I, I found the modern day crossing, and it's, I mean, it's a biblical crossing. It's been there for yeah. thousands of years. Though. So yeah. I mean, I can't thank you enough for that. This is an absolute gem. Uh, and in it, by the way, it came with this sitting in it oh cool. which i can i can only assume is a picture of the coast of palestine about that time i mean i'll, I'll do a google lens or something but i you know mm, mm. It, it had that as a little bonus uh, you know, and it's got some newspaper bonus. cuttings and all sorts i mean look at the back of it it's so that i mean i can't very thank very big bonus that. yeah, very <laughs> big bonus for yeah? <laughs> so i mean i'm hugely grateful for that um and I think, we'll, I think we'll wrap it up there. But, I mean, the one thing that I need to ask you before we wrap it up is to please show me your weapon. <laughs> <laughs> I've been itching to say that all the way through. Look at this, everyone. Look. This is an original 1917 short magazine, Lee Enfield. It's short because the previous iterations of the 303 rifle by Lee Enfield, Lee and Enfield refers to the way it's loaded as the weapon. This is the only one we could hold it in position and fire it because all the German ones and Austrian ones had a sticky out bolt that she had to go like that so it will bash you in the face. But this comes out and gets you know, pushed down and it does that. And when something goes off half cocked, you pull it out halfway, that's half cocked. Put it out all the way, that's fully cocked. So that's where the phrase for that comes from. It replaced two rifles, and the British Army always wanted to do things on the cheap. Instead of having a weapon, which was a carbine for the cavalry and mounted troops, and a longer rifle for infantry, they decided they'll split the difference and have this. This is why it's called a short comma magazine, because it's got a magazine on it. Lee Enfield, the type of stuff that goes with the, and the action lee and enfield um and this is an oh, let's just get it right this is a mark three star they took off the volley sights we've still got sights here up to can't see in this light but you know you could you could you can hit somebody a mile away with one of these and it was still used as a sniper's weapon right up until the late 70s and 80s because it was so good. And a quick look at the rather gruesome um, bayonet. Like this this just sends a chill through me, it really... The original bayonet for it was this, which came off the long Lee Enfield, magazine loading Lee Enfield, quite short. They just clip on quite easily. There's a little button on the side which you press in to get it onto here. And it locks into position and it's really solid. But they felt that because this was a short rifle, 
they needed something longer. So in 1907, the 1907 version came in, and this is the old 18 inches of cold steel. Again, it's the same contraption the way you put it on, just there. Locks into position, solid as a rock. And uh, that's the rifle, standard rifle. Um, it came to another iteration with the number four um, from 1943 onwards, but you would still see them in the 50s and 60s. That's amazing. I mean, even when, been... even That's... when in 1955 the Belgian FN rifle was adopted and then called the self-loading rifle or the SLR at a seven point, <coughs> sorry, excuse me, seven point six two round, whereas that's a point three oh three of an inch, and seven point six two was the standard NATO round until they decided to adopt the five five six, which is a lot smaller because of seven point six two will stop somebody and fully stop them, but a five five six round millimeter. Um, was originally designed to wound people because they thought, ah, oh, well, if you wound enough of them, they'll, mm. other mates will stop to look after them. But as was found in um, the early part of this century, in the past 20 years, they don't stop them. They don't take any notice of people who get injured because they're not like us normally. Oh, well, I, I just find the bayonets really bring it home that it's real people... Mm. You know, living and dying so but so, so let's let's make a wrap there i just i can't thank you enough thanks for making this oh, time it's saturday morning um i i love your the trove the your den in there it's just absolutely amazing and i i'm i just feel so lucky to have found you on that and the society of genealogists um armed forces hour oh, thank you uh, and it's a real pleasure just dipping into your knowledge and finding a bit more about you so thank you very much that's quite all right thank you Simon.